what's the extent of Hebrew knowledge among people here? Minimal. Minimal. Some, some people know Hebrew, but I, I teach in English. You teach in English. And they have Chumashim. We have Chumashim, so it's the yeah. time from it. That's fine, yeah. presentation is live streamed to the whole world, so if it's okay, I'll clip this to your lapel. You don't have to touch it, you don't have to mess with it, and it doesn't do anything. It doesn't amplify you in this room, but it allows people all over the world to watch you and steal your material. Tova wants to wake up in the morning and watch you. She can do that too. Yeah. Don't mess with it. Don't. Okay. Good morning. What a morning. What a morning. Is everybody all right? Like yeah, now it's beginning to, because the, today the I wind stopped. This morning, I can smell it in my living room, not in my bedroom. There are slightly ashes in the car, and I thought it would be a good idea to get gas in case we move, you know, and it's like, and then we have this, you have the discussion, what if you have to evacuate, what do you take? Where are you? Where do you, where? No, oh, well, you're not going to have to. Yeah, but if you, if you at least play the hypothetical, what are you going to take? And the answer was laptop. Desktop pictures. Wife. <laughs> Take the wife. Take the wife. Okay. That one too. That's what are we going? Take the wife. Take the wife. So when you're done, we'll put chairs here and we can talk, okay? Whatever you want. I can ask you some hard questions. You like to stand when you talk. Yeah, I want no, we just do a little bit, a few verses in the beginning of each parsha. Okay. We read minimally and study maximally. Okay. You leave a chair over there. Okay. Yeah. So don't worry about that, though. That's good. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you again. That was wonderful. Wonderful. Good morning. Are you kids okay? Fountain View is safe. Yeah, they're they're staying with Jesse. I understand. They stay, well, they went to San Diego today. Yeah, they went to conference in San Diego. It's nuts outside. The house will be all right. They're, the house where they used to live, the one in Oak Park, that neighborhood is threatened. They've lost a lot of homes in that neighborhood. Did you? It's a beautiful neighborhood. It's big trouble. It's big trouble. Big trouble. You can watch it on TV and worry. That's that's a good thing to do. I like that very much. I, I like that very much. Good. Everybody is safe in your home? Everybody's okay? Um, a lot of folks moving around. So if, if anybody finds themselves in need of a place to stay, let us know. There are a lot of families that have volunteered bedrooms and bathrooms. And, yes? Not yet. Thank you. We've had a lot of families volunteer, and so far, no one, everyone's found place with family and friends. So, so far, we're okay. Yeah, that's what it, it well, you know, you, it's like a slumber party. You make, you pretend it's summer camp, and you smoosh together. Good. So, good morning, everyone. Shabbat shalom. It's a, a very interesting morning. Um, so, first, everybody's safe. That's the most important thing. Um, good morning. Just, uh, there are, um, they said 250,000 people displaced from their homes, and they've lost 150 homes. This morning, the air is full of smoke because up until yesterday, the wind was blowing offshore, and today the wind stopped. So this is the smoke that's filling up the valley. The good news is because the, the wind stopped, they can use the airplanes now to hit the fire. Unfortunately, tomorrow, the winds are supposed to start again which means the air will be clean, but the airplanes won't be able to fly, which makes the harder 
job for the firefighters. Um, so we just have our prayers with all of those people who've lost homes and all of those who are fighting the fire. Um, this morning, um, this morning, uh, Shomrei Torah Synagogue, which was evacuated at midnight, is here with us this morning. So this morning, we're, we're playing slumber party here at VBS. So I'll introduce our guest in a moment, but following our learning this morning, um, you have one, two, three, four, five choices besides going to Costco. Um, you, uh, there's a bar mitzvah of two lovely young men in the sanctuary uh, and an ufruf. Um, library minion is meeting, uh, Tat Shabbat will meet, and Shomrei Torah Synagogue is going to be in Sherlapati uh, Chapel. They have a bar mitzvah there as well. Um, and you're welcome to pray with us. Uh, about noon, we'll have lunch together. Um, I don't remember what it is. It's something good. Um, and then this afternoon, we're going to have a second opportunity to learn. I'll in introduce our guest with Professor Brettler. Um, so please stick around. It's, uh, it's going to be smoky and nasty outside, but it'll be very nice, warm in here. And we'll all have a chance to learn together. Um, again, if you know of any families in the community who are in need of places, we have lots of families that have offered rooms uh, and place to stay, so let us know if, that, if that's needed. Um, hopefully, this, this won't last too long. Um, this next week, we'll have College of Jewish Studies will commence again on Wednesday night, and we will welcome uh, Rabbi Bradley Shavit Artson, who will be our guest, and he's a wonderful theologian. He'll be talking about his work in something called process theology. Very, very interesting ideas about God. Um, and then on Friday night, uh, Herschel has his annual comedy night. Uh, he invites two wonderful Jewish comedians to come and entertain us. So we'll dive in about 7.30 and about 8 o'clock we'll do this show. And it's always funny because Herschel's much funnier than the comedians, but, uh, <laughs> but don't tell them that. It's, uh, it's sweet. And our next, Friday, next Shabbos, um, our guest will be uh, Sarah Kramer, uh, Kramer. Sarah Kramer is one of the executive leaders of a place in Israel called Beit Beryl. Uh, Beit Beryl is the biggest, uh, the biggest institution of higher learning in the state of Israel. It's a teacher's college, and they've done pioneering work in bringing Israelis and Palestinians together to create school programs. What's the name? Beit Beryl. It's named for a famous Zionist leader, Beryl Katzenelson. He's dead, but the place is open, so it's a. Uh, it's a wonderful, and she'll be telling us about, about educating Israel, the different school systems and how education in Israel works, and how you make a diverse population into one nation uh, using education. So please join us for that, okay? Um, this weekend, we are blessed to have with us a, a, an old friend and a wonderful, wonderful teacher, uh, Professor Mark Brettler. Well, I'll tell you how I know him first. He was Nina's classmate at Brandeis. That's how I know him first. Um, Nina went on to the rabbinate and to illustrious things, including our family. And Mark went on to complete his degrees and, and, uh, and credentials with the great professor, Nachum Sarna. You're cold? I'll warm you up in a minute. You know how this goes. Come on in, come on in. Professor Brettler, uh, a, a few years ago, moved from Brandeis southward to Raleigh-Durham, where he's professor of religion at Duke University. And uh, I'll <coughs> embarrass him and tell you that he's one of the world's leading Bible scholars. And he's been gracious enough to spend the morning with us. So this morning, we get him, just us. And we're going to be talking about the book of Genesis, an intelligent reading of the book in Genesis. And this afternoon, after lunch, if you'll stick around and have a few enchiladas with us, about 12.30, quarter to 1, more or less, we'll meet back here. And this afternoon, he's going to talk to us about why Jews should read the Christian Bible and what they'll find there when they read it. So this morning, Genesis, this afternoon, uh, the Christian New Testament. Please welcome Professor Mark Weller. You want it warmer, colder? Just tell me, I'll, I'll fix it. <laughs> Give it a minute. It's supposed to be 82 degrees today, which means it'll be 106 on this side of the room and 43 on that side of the room. It'll average out to 86. Mark, welcome. We're glad to have you here. The troubles of being a rabbi and dealing with the temperature. I must say, I've never been introduced before, and part of the introduction dealt with a slumber party. So I'm getting a little nervous. I hope I will not be part of that slumber party for you. Uh, I, I very much appreciate that you're here now. I know this has been a very, very difficult week and a half in all sorts of ways, especially 
in this particular area. But it is Shabbat. Shabbat is a time really to take off. Shabbat is a time to be in its own world. Shabbat is a time to turn to Jewish texts. And I'm really happy to see so many people who are here interested in doing that. I've created, I'm, also, I'm a stander, I'm a pacer, so I know you're used to people sitting. So I apologize for standing. I'm not trying to stand over you in any way. Uh, I need to create a word for talking about what I'm going to discuss today, which is how I and many other biblical scholars understand the book of Genesis, Sefer Breshit. Now, you may not use this word in Scrabble, and you may not use this word in Bananagrams, because it does not exist. I'm going to give you the word and spend a couple of minutes explaining it. The word is misgenrefication, by which I mean, what happens if you understand a work by the wrong genre and therefore interpret it in the wrong way. So let me give you two examples that describe that. Let's say I started my talk today by saying I'm a sardine. And I talked about how I am a sardine. Now, I will admit that as I walked from the Marriott here, I passed the, one of the branches of the UCLA Health Center and I imagine that if I went on long enough about my being a sardine, one of you would very kindly take me by hand and would walk me to the UCLA Health Center and say, well, you know, we have a visiting scholar. He seems to have had some trauma on the way from Durham, North Carolina to LA. He thinks he's a sardine. You know, this morning's talk is, go is a wash. You know, can you do anything for him so that at 12.30, he's able to give a proper talk for us? Okay, that's what you might do. But if you're reading a poem, and this is actually where I got the idea, if you're reading a poem about the Japanese subway system, or I actually grew up in New York, or about the New York subway system, where a person describes himself or herself as a sardine because they are packed into the subway cars, right? That would be perfectly normal because you have understood that that is a metaphor, that is figurative language. So in other words, if I'm a sardine in a poem, and a poem is a different genre than a speech. If I'm a sardine in a poem, that's fine. If I'm a sardine talking to you this morning, well, that would be a little bit weird. Okay, let me give you a second example. And for this example, you know, don't take me too seriously. I do not believe in Martians, but I need to create somebody who I'm going to call Martha, Martha the Martian for this particular example. And maybe again, you're going to want to take me to the UCLA Health Center, Mental Health Center. So let's imagine, or please just stay with me and imagine, and I promise I'm gonna to get to the text very soon. Imagine a Martian who has totally mastered the English language, you know, has memorized an English grammar and has memorized you know, Webster's Martian English Dictionary. And this Martian was sitting next to me tomorrow morning as I'm perusing the LA Times. Okay. Now first I read, I don't know which I'll read first. Maybe first I'll read the first page and then I will quickly turn to Doonesbury in the comic section. Now the words that are used in Doonesbury are exactly the same. The language is exactly the same as the words that are used in the first section of the LA Times, in the first page of the LA Times. And this Martian would think initially that what the comic section is doing is no different than what the first page of the Times is doing. And would think that, that, that Doonesbury 
is telling news. There are a couple of seats up here. I don't, yeah, I'm the one. Uh, the, the, the James Berry is telling news in exactly the same way that the first page of the LA Times is telling news. Now, and some of you, I don't know what your feeling is about Doonesbury, about the LA Times. Some of you may think that Doonesbury is actually more true than the first page of the LA Times. You know, when I used to give this talk in Boston, I would certainly say that about the Boston Globe versus the uh, other sections of the globe. But in any case, my point is a simple one. The words are the same, but the genre is different. And somewhere along the line, most of you, I hope all of you have learned, that the same words in the comic section and the same words on page one are different genres and need to be interpreted differently. One is supposed to refer to, I'm afraid to use the word now, the real news of what is happening, while the other, even though it might have some of those same words, is primarily supposed to have an entertainment value. And if you read the comic section in the same way that you read page one, you are going to misgenrefy, incorrectly identify the genre of the comic section, and therefore, you're going to interpret it incorrectly. You're going to be guilty of misgenrification. I mean, another good example of this would be, you know, let's say uh, you're, you're, hearing this, you're hearing Hamlet for the first time and you hear something is rotten in the state of Denmark and suddenly you think that somebody bought really old eggs and that is, that is what's going on. You have misidentified the genre. You have taken something that is metaphorical and you have understood it literally. So therefore, the real question is, what is the genre of the narrative material in the Torah? And especially for this morning, what I'm going to talk about is what is the genre of the narrative material in the book of Genesis? Because the first words of the book of Genesis are, Bereshit bara Elohim, which I'm going to translate, I'll follow the JPS, something like when God began to create, in the beginning of God's creation. I'm not going to get hung up on the correct translation of the first two verses of the Torah. It does not have a label that says, I am history, or I am natural science, or I am metaphor, or I am myth, or I am something else. The only, the only label this material ultimately has within Jewish culture is I am Torah. So ultimately, my real question is, how are we to understand this narrative material that is in Torah? And just to give you a simple example of how bad it could be if you understand something in the wrong genre, if you take something literally because you think that's what the words mean. Uh, this story, true story, happened to me you know, 20 years ago. We were away on vacation. We had somebody in her early teens who was responsible for bringing our mail in. On our front door, there, she actually wrote a sign that said, important mail is in the corner of the dining room table. Okay, now. You know, I'm a, I'm, you're getting it. Okay, I'm a professor. It's not like I get a whole lot of important, urgent mail. What was on the corner of the dining room table? A pile this high that was labeled urgent open immediately. Okay? Now, what, what this young teen did was to read literally and to misgenrefy what junk mail is. No, I say this quite seriously. So the question is, again, how, is, how are we supposed to read these stories from the beginning of the book of Genesis? Well, it might seem to you, and today we're going to be talking about various historical characters in the Torah reading. We're going to be talking about the birth of Esau. I'm going to come to that eventually. See, I actually think I have a lot of time 
because the rabbi told me I can speak in 10.15 to 10.30. And that clock only says, it's on double, it's on double, it's on double daylight savings time. It's on 7.15. But this is actually better than the time I was once speaking to a congregation. And the rabbi told me you could speak for 10 minutes, but neglected to tell me that the clock I was looking at had been broken for 15 years. So then, then I was even worse off. But in any case, I would like to make a couple of arguments. The first argument is that even though this material in some ways looks like history, in our sense, what we may have studied in high school or college as history, the notion of history whose main goal is, or at least used to be, to get things right, to map out, and I'm happy later to talk about the word map, to map, because history never fully tells you exactly what happens. It's like a map. It's schematic. It tells you part of what happens when you write actual history. So you think that ancient history is trying to map, that or map the world in the same way. So here, I'd like to make a couple of different arguments to show you that even though we tend to think of history in that sense, when we talk about history within the Bible, we should not think of it in that way. First of all, history as we know it, and this is actually pretty surprising every time I say it, whose main goal is to just get the world right. And so you would imagine by which I mean, you know, a map facing north, which had California on the east and New York on the west, would simply be wrong, right? Well. That notion of mapping, getting things right in terms of history, did not exist in antiquity. And the main point of history in antiquity, some of you, I was just at the border of, when I started high school, they no longer had civics, but it had just been canceled. History in antiquity was much more like civics than like history, where the goal of civics is not for you to get the facts right, but the goal is to either use facts or to make up facts. I mean, a very good example, and I hate to break this to you, but George Washington really did not cut down a cherry tree, to take an example from civics. But one of the goals of civics was to tell stories about the past, to make you a better person, to make you a better citizen. And it is not crucial that this material correctly mapped the past. So that's one hesitation I have with understanding Genesis as history. Let me give you a second hesitation. It's an etymological one about the word history. Uh, the word history actually comes from Greek, historia. It's actually used by Herodotus, the, often considered to be the first great historian, and it means investigations. So let's talk a little bit about investigations. If I'm writing modern history, and by the way, this is happening a whole lot right now, and I hear two different stories about what really happened, one of my jobs would be to investigate and to decide which of the two or three or 10 stories is the correct one. So if a student gives me a paper, this happens all the time, and the student says, according to so-and-so, this is what happened, and according to so-and-so, this is what happened, I write back to the student and say, well, thank you very much for giving me two different opinions about what happened, but can you please tell me which one of them, based on your investigations, again, the etymological meaning of history, is more likely to be. Now, the Bible is not history. So here, this is a bit of a trick question. It's a bit of a trick question, but I'm, I'm going to trick you. We'll see if you're going to be tricked. So you look at the beginning chapters of the book of Genesis, and I ask you the following question. This is like, if you still watch, I haven't watched Who Wants to Be a Millionaire in ages. But the beginning of who wants to be a millionaire, the way they would choose which contestant is they would ask you to put certain 
things in order, like states and orders from east to west, or historical events like Civil War, World War I, World War II, Korean War in, in order. So put the following in order, please. The creation of birds, according to the book of Genesis, the creation of birds, the creation of land animals, the creation of man, and the creation of woman. So can you please put these three items in order for me? What comes first? We have a consensus here. This is like ask the audience. OK, birds. Thank you. What comes next? Land animals. Land animals. Thank you. What comes next? Oh, so man and woman. OK, now finally we are getting somewhere. Because some people are trying to say that it depends on the story. And it sure does depend on the story in more ways than you think. So if you open your Chumashim, if you open Eitz Chaim, you're even going to see that in terms of what some of you initially said, uh, you, there are really two answers. So you could point to me, page 8, on page 8, Genesis chapter 1, uh, verse, verses 20 and following, that, the, that there you have birds are created in Genesis chapter 1, verse 21. This is a whole other great story, but good, great verse. God created the great sea monsters. That's really what it says and all the living creatures of every kind that creep, which the waters brought forth in swarms, and all the winged birds of every kind. Okay, so that's the beginning of day five. Then, certainly you are correct, the next thing that is created are various land animals in verse 24. God said, let the earth bring forth every kind of living creature, cattle, creeping things, wild beasts of every kind. And then a little later in day six, you have chapter one, verse 27, toward the, uh, in the English, it's the top of the next page, top of page 10. And God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Okay, and I'll just point out, this translation is problematic because the word for man is Adam, which is gender neutral. So a better translation would be, God created person in his image. In the image of God, did he create it? And then here it gets a little complicated. This reminds me of one thing. Should I read that male and female, he created them, which would mean that man and woman were created together? Or should I read that as male and then female, he created it? Hebrew allows for either. I favor the first. Yeah. I think those are imagined to be like dragonflies and all those swarm gnats, all those swarming sorts of insects. Not just birds. Not just birds. So anything that's, that flies that is in the air. Yeah. Now, so good. So most of you did well. Except that lions and tigers are land animals. So lions and tigers are day six. Lions and tigers and bears, oh my, oh my, are day six. Now, in the second creation story, because indeed there are two creation stories which have come together here, please turn to well, the creation of man man, male, is up to page 15. And then God says, turn to page 16, please. The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a fitting helper for him. Now, this is what most people don't realize about this story. Don't cheat and look ahead. What did God do then? Thank you for making what I call the mistake I wanted you to make. <laughs> Take a look. 
take a look. No, 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 no. Take a look at verse 19. And the Lord God formed out of the earth all the wild beasts and all the birds of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that would be its name. Huh. So according to this story, which most people tend to forget, so you might not win on who will be a, become a contestant on who wants to be a millionaire if you forget this. Uh, man is created first. Then it seems more or less at the same time, land animals and birds are created. Then, and I say this very seriously, unlike the first story in Genesis, in which God does not have a sense of humor, right? It's very hard to read Genesis chapter one and to laugh. This story is actually pretty funny, right? So man is created. Okay, man, how would you like to be with a crocodile? No, that's a little threatening. How about a gnat? A little too small, not satisfying. Uh, how about, since you mentioned lions and tigers, lions and tigers, no, 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 no. That doesn't work. And so you see the end of verse 20, but for Adam, no fitting helper was found. So this is God the experimentalist. Now I say this seriously. This is God the experimentalist. And then af only after that experiment fails, take a look at verse 21. So the Lord God cast a deep sleep upon the man. While he slept, he took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh at that spot, and then fashioned that rib into a woman. And then man is finally satisfied. Now, let me go back to my main point. If, if the Bible is history, if the Bible is interested in telling a single story, if the Bible is interested in investigating and getting things right, then this certainly is not history, right? Because it is offering, and this might be what some of you might call postmodern history, but the Bible is not a postmodern book. This is offering two alternative stories without deciding which one of those stories is really the right one. So that is among the many reasons why I think we should not consider the Bible to be history. Well, if it's not history, what is it? Well, one of the things that I said is, it is Torah, and Torah does not mean law. So something very sad happens when the Bible was translated from Hebrew to Greek in the third pre-Christian century. That translation, according to various ancient traditions, was accomplished by 72 or 70 people and is thus called the Septuagint. And in that, in that translation, the word Torah got translated in Greek as nomos. Wow, good for you. And nomos means law in Greek. Some of you might know the English word antinomian, which means those people who don't like law. That comes from the same Greek root, nomos. And as a result, Torah often gets translated as law. But look at the stuff that we're in the middle of. So good trivia question, how many laws are there in the book of Genesis? I, uh, oh, I, I hear one, what's the one that you have? Pru or, or vu, be fruitful and multiply. There's another one. What's the other one? Brit la. thank you very much. Circumcision. Those are the two in the book of Genesis. So don't worry, the last book of the Bible, Deuteronomy, more than makes up in terms of getting us there to 613. Which actually, I'm gonna talk about that tradition of 613 a little bit at 12.30 in the afternoon. But very few laws, and the right, the right understanding of Torah is not as law, but is instruction. And the question is, what instructs in addition to law? Laws instruct, but stories instruct as well. And uh, some of you may agree, some of you may disagree, that in some ways, fiction 
is more instructive than nonfiction. Okay? What you really want to understand about life, you often read fiction rather than nonfiction. And as such, these stories should not be understood as literally true, but should be understood in the same way that we understand serious fiction, understand in what way they are meant to instruct us, what they are trying to teach us, how they function as Torah. So let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, and then we're going to quickly come to an example from our parasha, to which I'm going to need to give you a little bit of background that I hope will make the Torah reading, at least from the beginning of the parasha today, a little richer, give it a little more sense. So my first example is going to be from the first creation story from Genesis chapter 1. And here, just to follow along with me, uh, go back to the creation of person, of the person in Genesis chapter 1, on page number 9. And I'm going to make a very simple point, and I'm going to come back to this point a couple of times. One of the things that stories do is they create value judgments about what is important what is not important. So this is not a, this is not a trick question. This is a, a simple one. The answer should not be surprising. In the first creation story in Genesis, where the world is created in six days, though I do have a little trick in this question, what is the most important thing that is created? You, man, I'm actually going to use the word human because that is, by and large, the term that is used. It is Adam. Okay, I will point out that in the 1960s, when the JPS Torah was translated, man was used very differently than it is right now in 2018. There are some people who actually did use the word man in a gender-neutral sense, but that is no longer the sense in which many of us believe it should be used in the English language. Okay, so humans. So now I'm going to do the obnoxious professor thing. Prove it to me. In what way, just take a good look at this text. In what way or ways does this text create a value system or a hierarchy and say that people are more important than anything else that is created? Okay, I'll do, actually you're saying two things at the same time. Our likeness. So first of all, only people are in divine likeness. Secondly, huh, that our, plural. Now, the most likely understanding of that our, which really starts with na'ase adam, let us make human in verse 26, is that God, being depicted as a king, has a cabinet. He consults this cabinet. In later Judaism, this cabinet becomes you know, angels in one sense or another. And people are important enough, unlike, let's say, tigers or crocodiles, that God is consultive when before creating people. So those are two ways in which this is special. The us and in the divine image. Good. How else is, are humans marked as being special in this creation story? Okay, good. So I, I, I like that image very much. So last is the best. Okay, I will point out humans are the climax of creation. 
uh, I'll point out that some newer feminist readings, but this actually goes out, goes back to a book which, if I'm remembering my date correctly, was completed in 1895, The Woman's Bible, which was completed by Elizabeth Stady Canton, who was one of the early suffragettes. She makes that same point about the second creation story, where woman is clearly created at the end, and therefore woman is the climax of creation, rather than the way in which it is typically read as woman being an afterthought. So what you said has very may have very important implications. But returning to the story, okay, right. people are the climax of the creation. Okay. There's at least there are one or two other things which indicate that people are the climax. Say that again. Thank you. Only people are given rule and dominion. Uh, let me say something else. Just listen to this verse in Hebrew. It is chapter 1, verse 27. And I cannot do this with any other verse in the first creation story. I'm going to exaggerate it so you get my point. Vayivra Elohim et ha'adam b'tzalmo. B'tzalem Elohim bara oto. Zachar unekeva bara otam. What did that reading emphasize? What does that verse sound like? It sounds like poetry. Vayivra Elohim et ha'adam b'tzalmo. B'tzalem Elohim bara oto. Zachar unekeva bara otam. I can beat it out like poetry. It has, and this is very typical of biblical material, it actually has lots of word repetitions. You could hear the word selem, image twice. You could hear the word bara three times. You could hear the word oto and otam mirroring each other. Again, just now that I've said that, vayivra Elohim et haadam b'tzalmo, b'tzalem, Elohim bara oto, zachar unekeva bara otam. That brings a certain type of climax as well into the creation of people. So that this does give you a sense, this does create a value of people being the most important thing that, uh, that is created. So again, note I'm not reading the story literally. I am reading the story as creating a relative hierarchy among, among that which is created. But now I come to a little trick. What is created after people? Shabbat. Now, what's more important, people or Shabbat? That's why I asked it. Thank you. <laughs> I, 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 I tried to, try to ask good questions. Yeah, what do you think? You can't have Shabbat without people. You can have people without Shabbat. Okay. So that is a very good beginning of this. Ah, okay. So now you're seeing this question. Very nice. This question of what is more important, the Sabbath or people, is not a trivial question because uh, if it is Shabbat and if a person is in mortal danger, that is what pikuach nefesh is, I'll say that according to Jewish law, you have to, not only may you, but you have to violate the Shabbat in, in that particular case. But let me ask another, why don't you turn you, you've seen this so many times. You recite it every Friday night. But turn to pages 11 and 12 and look at the English of the Shabbat passage. And there is one word in that Shabbat passage which is not present in the case of humans. What is that word? What does Shabbat have that humans do not have? I know. Um, the, 
Did you not have anything over here? <laughs> ah, okay. So, you, well, I feel like I'm back at Duke. I always know when it's five o'clock at Duke because we have we have a great chapel with great bells. So, the people are blessed as well. So, Vayivarech is not the, is not uh, special to Shabbat, but Vayikadesh. He sanctified them. If you look at uh, God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy. Huh. Shabbat, this is, this is odd. We very rarely see absences. <laughs> that's, a, that's just the way in which we think. But according to this first, according to this creation story, people are not initially created holy, or they're not marked as being created holy. Holiness belongs to Shabbat, not to people. And therefore, there, you can actually have a competition between a type of physical creation that is the most important, and let's call it a non-physical or a metaphysical creation, namely Shabbat, which is most important. There are values that are being established here. Those are religious values. And what I want to talk about next are political values that are being established in the Bible. Now, this is hard for us to appreciate because we are living, except for me, I live in the BCE periods in terms of the way in which I think. But most of you are living in the current period rather than in ancient Israel. So in order for this to make a little bit more sense to you, in order for the book of Genesis to make a little bit more sense to you, I'm going to ask you, you might not have realized that you have maps in the back of Eitz Chaim. So I need to give you a very quick geography lesson. And I am going to argue that if, without this geographical background, I'm going to be on map it's easiest for me, the map that says the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. The kingdoms of Israel and Judah. I must say, it looks like they did not number their maps, and there are no pages. So it is one, two, three, four, five. It is the fifth map that you have here. The kingdoms of Israel and Judah. And I'm going to talk about this map a little bit. As you would imagine, this works a little bit better if it is not Shabbat and I have a PowerPoint and a pointer behind me, but we're going to manage fine with this. So let me talk about a few realities concerning ancient Israel, which are reflected in the book of Genesis. One reality. Usually when we think of ancient Israel, we think of the area around Jerusalem which you could see in your map is marked in large letters with Judah. Okay. Now, to the north of that, there is an area which is much larger, and that is an area which in ancient Israel was called Israel. I know this is really confusing because Israel ultimately is used in two different senses, and you could see the word Israel. No, right there across. So, a little background. According to the biblical account, the first real king was sort of Saul, then David and Solomon, each of whom reigned for 40 years. Sounds a little too typological, makes me a little nervous in terms of reading this as real history, who controlled the area of Judah and Israel. After Solomon died, there was a civil war somewhere around the year 922, and Judah and Israel became separate people. This is often reflected in the Haftorahs that we read. Israel, the kingdom of Israel, also called the Northern Kingdom, lasted for about 200 years until the year 722, when the Mesopotamian Assyrians exiled them and at that point, they became what many of you think of as the 10 lost tribes who are not in Ireland, who are not the Native Americans. They're lost, okay? 
Even if you have nothing to do, don't go looking for them. They're lost, okay? So that's northern Israel and the 10 lost tribes. Israel and Judah had a number of neighbors. One of these neighbors across from Israel, you can see here, uh, is Ammon, the Ammonites. South of them are Moab, the Moabites. And south of them still is Edom, the Edomites, which in a few minutes is going to bring us to our Torah portion. Now, how do you feel about your neighbors? Uh, don't tell me. This is, <laughs> this, is, this is a rhetorical question. How did ancient Israel feel about its neighbors? By which I mean, how did ancient Israel get along with its neighbors? Well, things have not changed a whole lot. Ancient Israel did not get along very well with its neighbors. Well, and if you're writing a, nat if you're writing a national history, one way of talking about that is by depicting your neighbors in a not so pleasant way. So I'm not allowed to say this, but you know, whoever answers this can get an extra brownie. Are there brownies during Kiddush? Yes. You get to get, a, you get, to get an extra brownie during Kiddush. Okay, let, let's talk, and this is a little R-rated, as the Bible often is, and this is why the Bible has been banned by some public libraries. I'm actually serious about this. Anybody happen to remember the origin of the Ammonites and the Moabites? Okay, good. Lot. What about Lot? So first of all, who is Lot? Lot is Abraham's nephew. So close relatives, which of course makes sense given the close geographical proximity. But what is the origin of, according to the Bible, of the Ammonites and the Moabites? Incest. Okay, incest. So you could turn, if you just were, never realized this before, to page 109. This is right after the destruction of the city of Sodom, where Lot was told to leave the city along with his daughters. He left the cities along with the daughters, and at the top of the page, they are in a cave together. And they think they are the last three people left. And therefore, this is pretty creepy, verse 31, it's supposed to be creepy. The older one said to the younger, our father is old, there is not a man on earth to consort with us in the way of all the world. What beautiful euphemisms. Come, let us make our father drink wine, let us lie with him, that we may, we may maintain life through our fathers. Our father, excuse me. That night they made their father drink wine, the older one went in and lay with her father. He did not know when she lay down and when she rose. The next day, the older one said to the younger, essentially, it's my turn. They did it. They made their father drunk. And as I say about the Bible and its attitude toward fertility, it has a very strange bipolar attitude toward fertility. Either you could tremendous difficulty getting pregnant, Sarah, Rebecca, Hannah, or you conceive immediately, right? Uh, Bathsheba, some other woman, like these two, they conceive immediately and they bear, they, each one of them bears a son. Quite remarkably, all these women who conceive immediately always bear sons and not daughters. Yes? Yeah, no, yeah, Lot lo doesn't say where, that at where all. Where was I? He's, but because you know, you're making a very excellent point that Lot doesn't say anything, but it's not important for the story, right? 
So the Bible often does not tell us things that are irrelevant for the story. Almost every detail directly fits what the story is talking about. So here only the incest and the naming comes through. So, and this is what gets lost in translation along with much else. The name Moab is here being etymologized or here being understood as Me'av from daddy. Mm. That's a little creepy, right? Uh, Amon, the word Am, in addition to meaning nation, also means kin or kinsfolk. So the name Amon really means, oh, deriving from my own kin. Okay. Now, let's try to say this the right way. This is not the real origin of the names Moab and Amon. I think if you, you know, walked along the street and you met an Ammonite and a Moabite and you said, oh, you know, why are you, where does the name Moab come from? They would have had a very different etymology or origin for that particular name. But what this story is doing is it is explaining from an ancient Israelite perspective why these two nations, the two city-states, Ammon and Moab, which are so close, right? Uh, we really don't get along with them. We really don't like them. Okay. Let me give you another example, and then I'm going to come and conclude with the example of Parsha, and then have a couple of questions, because you know, I, I have another two and a half hours in which I can be here. Okay. The Joseph story. I know we're not there yet. But one of the things that I said about the Joseph story, I'm sorry, one of the things that I said when I showed you the map, which sounded irrelevant when I showed you the map, was I talked about the different kingdoms of Judah and Israel. And if you go back and you look at the map, you will see the main two tribes in the center right above Judah are Ephraim and Manasseh, who are the two oldest children of Joseph. So now let's start thinking. Of all the children, I'm sorry, uh, I'm going to ask it a little bit differently. Judah, down here, super important because according to the biblical account, King David comes from Judah. Okay. What number in the birth order is Judah? Fourth. Fourth. Okay, so let's go through it. Reuben, Reuven, Simeon, Shimon, Levi, Levi, and then Judah. Now that's a little strange. Which of the sons should have been the strongest? Reuven, because the Bible very much believes in primogeniture, you know, the significance and the inheritance rights of the eldest son. Oh, now let me go to the story, uh, the stories in Genesis. Huh. It's only half a verse. But you might remember what Reuben did, which was not so nice. What did Reuben do, which, which is not so nice? He slept with daddy's uh, concubine. He slept with daddy's concubine. You're not supposed to do that. Vayishma Reuben, and Reuben heard about it. Huh. What about Simeon and Levi? What did they do? That is not the most wonderful thing in the world. They killed, yeah, they killed the story of, of Dina, of Dinah, which uh, Anita Diamond <laughs> made very, very famous. Okay, they killed an entire city. They massacred an entire city. Huh. So part of what the book of Genesis is about that you're going to start reading in a couple of weeks, it is a political story pretold. It is explaining why David, coming from the tribe of Judah, even though he should not really have been so preeminent because he's number four, ultimately became the most preeminent. Because we got rid of number one, Reuben, 
because Reuben slept with his father's concubine. We got rid of numbers two and three because they massacred a Canaanite city. So therefore, this is a political story that you have. By the way, note, in the book of Genesis, who's more, who, okay, there's one more thing, then I'll come to that question. And that explains why in the book of Genesis, Judah is so important. So when Benjamin is captured, you're gonna have a spoiler alert. This comes in a few weeks, but I think you've heard it before. When, when Benjamin is held back by Joseph and his time to beg from Joseph to get Benjamin back, who is the brother who does it? Vayigash, that's what the parasha is named. Vayigash, Vayigash Elav Yehuda. Judah approached him. Now, another semi-trick question. Which brother is stronger in Genesis, Judah or Joseph? It seems to be jo Joseph really is the boss, right? Which reflects the fact that the Northern Kingdom was incredibly strong. But anybody remember, remember the first time Joseph is mentioned at the beginning of the book of Exodus? Vayakom melech chadash al Mitzrayim asher lo yada et Yosef. A new king arose in Egypt, who, I, I like the older English translation, who knew not Joseph. Joseph ultimately becomes forgotten, and thus Genesis, the, the second half of Genesis, and the very beginning of the book of Exodus is really about a bit of a power play. Which brings me, finally, to the parsha that we are going to read today, page 146. And I'm just gonna make a few quick points, and then I am happy to take questions about this. So this, the beginning, the beginning, so on page 146, 147, deals with the birth of Esau. I'm just going to point to a couple of verses. Huh. This is not a super happy birth. So verse 22. Uh, the children struggled in her womb. Huh. So they're struggling. Wow. Prenatal struggle. And she said, if so, why do I exist? She went to inquire of the Lord. Please note a very important early example, and there are quite a few others, of women praying directly to God in the Bible and in the rest of the Torah. The Lord answered her, verse 23, two nations are in your womb, two separate people shall issue from your body, one people shall be mightier than the other. Like, I hope you're the tension here. And then finally the clincher, the punchline, and the older, shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there indeed were twins in her womb. The first one emerged red. Vayetzei harishon admoni. Just remember that word, admoni, reddish, admoni. Okay, uh, Like a hairy mantle all over, so they named him Esau. His brother emerged, holding the heel of Esau. So they named him Jacob, etc. Okay. Now you know how the story continues. The story continues with each parent having his or her own favorite. And then when you turn to verse 29, once when Jacob was cooking a stew, so men, even in the biblical period, men cooked. Once, when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the open famished, and Esau said to Jacob, give me some of that red stuff. The Hebrew is beautiful for red stuff. Ha'adom, ha'adom hazeh. This really, really red, right? Because I'm tired, and then it goes on to say, oh, which is why 
he was called Edom. Okay? I remind you of the map. I'm going to bring you back to the map in a second, which is why he was called Edom. Okay, so Jacob, being a trickster brother, says, oh, happy to do it, but just sell me your birthright. Esau said, okay, I'm at the point of death, so what use is my birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Jacob then gave Esau bread. I mean, he was a nice brother. You know, the brother only wanted the lentils. Like, what use is lentils without bread? You actually needed bread because you didn't eat with silverware at that point. Silverware, you use it for individuals as a later creation. So Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew. He ate and drank. He rose and went away. Thus did Esau spurn the birthright. So what's going on here is, okay, earlier in the book of Genesis, we talked about Israel's relationship with Moab and Ammon. Later in the book of Genesis, we had a type of, maybe I'll call it a political allegory, dealing with the relationship between Judah, the southern kingdom, and Israel, the northern kingdom. Well, there's only one neighbor left, Edom on the bottom, right? Oh, they're a relative. They're a very close relative, right? They're, they're a brother. They're not even nephew's children. And by the way, you see they are a very close relative. They're contiguous with Judah, which is ultimately what this whole book is about. Oh, well, as a relative, hmm, we should get along with them well, but we don't. That's what I always just finish this sentence. Uh, well, and that's what the story is about. They were older, they should be strong, but you know what? They spurn the birthright for something as silly as a little lentil soup or lentil porridge, a little adom adom hazeh. That's why they're called Edom. That's why they are Edomites. And thus, the book of Genesis is not explaining patriarchal, as it's sometimes called, I prefer the term, ancestral history, but is really often talking about much later political events. And if you don't understand that, and you read it as a literal history, you're making the same mistake that I talked about before, where you're Martha the Martian, who does not understand why I read different sections of the LA Times differently, or you're functioning like that young high school student, that young teenager who told me, oh yeah, your urgent mail is on the dining room table. So that is the general framework that I would suggest for reading much of what is going on in Sefer Breshit for reading this material as Torah rather than as history. And now I'm very happy to take questions. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> just to go back to your use of the word misgenerification. Uh, in verse 23, where it talks about the birth of Jacob and Esau, if you remove the Masoretic vowels, right. there is an inconsistency in terms of the interpretation. You could interpret that reading as Esau actually is the stronger yes. and Jacob the weaker. Yes. That's the first thing, which changes the whole tenor of the story. And the second part is later when he sells the birthright. One cannot sell a birthright. Yes. The birthright is the right of the parents if they're going to do anything about birthright. That has to be done that way. So you, you get, you're getting an inconsistency in the story, and I would posit that, in a sense, Esau is the hero of the story. Not, and, and, and Jacob is, all through his life, he's the only prophet whose name changes back and forth. Yeah. Sometimes he's a prophet, and sometimes he's a weak need person who is vacillates constantly. Esau grows, Jacob does not grow. Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm happy for that. I mean, I'm seeing that more as a, as a point rather than as a question. 
And you know, I, I think that this reflects, let's put it this way, if you're writing a story about your ancestors, you might want to depict him a little better than Jacob is depicted in the Hebrew Bible. And I think, uh, I'm gonna sound like, like Woody Allen for a second, but I think this is reflective of an ancient Israelite inferiority complex. No, I mean, I'm saying that somewhat seriously, and that is, what is, uh, that is why you have such a strange depiction of Jacob in this particular story. I just wanna make sure everyone knows that people are gonna be leaving for dinner for sure. So following, first of all, I thank Dr. Bretler for being with us this morning and learning with us. Um, following our, our Torah study, there is any number of opportunities to pray. Um, there'll, there's the Bar Mitzvah, there's lovely Bar Mitzvah in the sanctuary, library meeting upstairs, uh, Ashabbat in the other room, and our friends from Shomri Torah Synagogue, which was evacuated last night, um, are here in the Sher Lapati uh, Chapel, and they have a, a couple of kids having their Bar Mitzvah as well. Um, then there'll be lunch, and I don't remember what it is today, but it's always Adom Adom. <laughs> worth selling your birthright for this one. <laughs> Sorry, I'm the youngest. <laughs> 12, 12.30, quarter to one. Just, just as soon as we finish a little bit of lunch, we're going to return back here for another session with Professor Brettler. And uh, this afternoon, he's going to be teaching on the, on the Christian Bible, on the New Testament. Uh, he's completed a work, right? A work of a uh, sort of Jewish reading of the New Testament. It's a companion to his other book, which is called How to Read the Bible. No, this is actually a companion to the Jewish Study Bible. The Jewish Study Bible. Yeah. The Jewish Annotated New Testament. Next time those guys come to your door to save your soul and you just rip this out. <laughs> and, and they will be, they will be so confused. In any case, it's a, it, it, you're all welcome to come back and we have another opportunity for those of us. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they'll, 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 they'll give you another trick. If they ever come to save your soul, they say, have you ever read the Bible? This I do all the time. I say, oh yes, I read the Bible often. And I take out the, my Hebrew Bible and I, and I say, okay, would you like to read some Bible together? They run so fast, you would not believe it. So please, uh, we, we, we have a few more minutes for some questions and then we'll go pray, we'll have a little lunch and we'll come back here at 12.30, if that's okay. Well, this is like the other night, the microphone doesn't work. No, no, that microphone doesn't amplify. It just puts you on the live stream. Okay. So thousands and thousands of people around the world are listening to you right now. No, pre no pressure. Okay. <laughs> One simple and a little bit more difficult question. In Noah sending out the raven not coming back and then sending out the dove subsequently, I don't know what the image or implication of the raven was. That's question number one. Number two, Abram becomes uh, uh, Abraham the Brit Mila. Yeah. It seems very primitive in terms of suddenly there's a covenant because the foreskin has to be amputated. Yeah. Where did that come from? Why is it so important in terms of our religion? Yeah, okay, so <laughs> which, one, which one was supposed to be the easy question? <laughs> I mean, uh, I'll, I'll just say, in terms of the first question, I mean, that, that actually is a little more complex one. Uh, the material concerning Noah is based on an ancient Mesopotamian myth, uh, the, uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, which tells a similar story about a guy whose name is Utnapishtim, which in Akkadian, the language of Mesopotamia, means he who has found life. And this is not really a fair answer to that question, but you have that same bird mix up there. So they have, it's actually a copying of that, of that particular story. So I don't know if there's any real significance of which bird does what. Uh, in terms of the second story, in your second question, circumcision was not unique to ancient Israel in the ancient world, although uh, it was not typically practiced in the ancient world. Uh, but if you go back to Genesis chapter 17, which is where it is first described. And this um, the Larry Hoffman, talks, a name you might know, teaches at Hebrew Union College, talks about quite a bit because he has a book on circumcision. That chapter is actually based on a certain type of irony because in that chapter, 
at that point, Abraham and Sarah, uh, Sarai are still childless. And there is a notion where circumcision is understood as an ancient fertility rite. So you, you lose your foreskin and you gain your ability to have children. And there's a certain irony that stands behind that chapter. And I think Larry, I think yeah, Rabbi Hoffman is correct in terms of understanding it in that way. And Thank women you. are welcome to ask questions as well. Uh, I, I'm asking for ammunition. I, I'm in a study group and half the people are constantly deconstructing this wonderfully constructed book. And two topics that you mentioned today, they would leap on. Th Judah, they would say, well, that's just an indication of the fact that Judah survived yep. and, w and wrote the history. And if you write the history, your ancestor gets elevated. Yeah. And, the, and the poetic reading of the response of the Lord to the struggling in the womb. Um, uh, Stephen Mitchell, when he does his translation of Genesis, insists that that not be part of Genesis, that it was obviously a later uh, insertion to justify what would otherwise be um, Rebecca's uh, interference uh, for for less than uh, divine reasons. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, I can't give you ammunition because I'm afraid that I agree more with the people you're trying to fight against. <laughs> Professor, um, in the beginning of your talk, you, um, as I also agree, you said that we should not read Torah as a historic book. Right. But when it comes to prayers and when it comes to considering my ancestors as Abraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, and all the other people that came before me, there is an element of history in it. Yeah, How do I reconcile both? Yeah, you're asking a very important question, which I will admit I think about quite a bit. So I don't know if this is satisfying for me I do not know that this will be satisfying for you or if it will ever become satisfying for you. And maybe I'm going to get fired. Uh, maybe I'm going to get fired at this point because I'm not doing a good job of answering your question or your question. When I say Elohei Abraham, it is the God of the Abraham whose stories are told in this book. And for me, it is the stories of what is told about that character that is more significant to me than the actual existence of such a character who did X, Y, and Z. That, that's, that's, that's for me. You mentioned primogeniture. There's not a single yeah. character in the book of Genesis right. that you know that, that gets to be that the firstborn is yeah. actually the inheritor of the tradition, right. and even you know our greatest prophet is also not the oldest. Where's the first instance where the oldest actually gets to be the you know the, the next rung? Yeah, so it never really happens in the Bible. It's always supposed to happen, but it never happens. And again, what I think that represents, and the question is very helpful in terms of reinforcing the basic point that I'm making, Israel recognizes that it is a late comer to the ancient Near Eastern world. So, you know, it's like being a Californian. I mean, I hate to break it to you. I grew up in New York and lived in Massachusetts. We were part of the Union first. <laughs> you guys, you, know, you, you guys, are a late addition. I mean, even after the Louisiana Purchase and all that other stuff, you know, in the wars with Mexico. So, you know, if you were American history from a Californian point of view, I've never said it this way, so I need to think a little on my feet. I mean, you're, you're going to have to show why even though you're so late, you are so great, right? Now, that's what the Bible is doing. So as I tell my students, <laughs> imagining, hoping that they go to museums. So if you go to museums 
and you look at the literature around ancient Israel. Ancient Israel is coming into being by the time of the Egyptian New Kingdom. Right? There is an old kingdom, a middle kingdom, and a new kingdom. It is coming into existence in the Neo-Assyrian, Neo-Babylonian period. I mean, it's late. It's very aware of its lateness. And that's why the Bible has to have as one of its themes, well, it's like what we talked about, the creation of woman and creation of man earlier. Last is the best. It's the opposite of the children's song, you know, first is the best. So from the ancient Israelite point of view, you never want to be first. You always really want to be last. That's, again, a very good indication of the symbolic manner in which these stories are being told. Can I, I just want to, let's, I want to ask you one last question and then we'll, we'll, we'll go and anyone who wants to chat with the professor. So I want to ask you sort of a personal question, if that's okay. And it's an extension of the question that, uh, that Farzan asked you a moment ago. Um, I know you to be a religiously observant Jewish person, right? And at the same time, you're a scholar, a modern scientific critical scholar of the Bible. So when you're wearing your scholarly modern scientific hat, you're taking this text, putting it in historical context, drawing its historical roots, criticizing it, and not criticizing in the sense of in any way putting it down, but discovering all of its, its, its authorship quirks. And then you come to shul, and they take it out as a scroll, and like everybody else, you stand up and we sing, V'zot ha-Torah aser sam Moshe. This is the Torah that God gave to Moshe that Moshe brought to us. And how does Mark, as professor and as Jew, reconcile those two, those two roles? Well, maybe that's really why you need to bring me to the UCLA Health Center. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, so uh, let, me, let me actually, that, that's, not qu that's, not quite a, that's not quite a fair answer. So, uh, so some of you may know that there are two books, at least two books, called How to Read the Bible, uh, one that I wrote and one that James Kugel uh, wrote a little after me. Uh, titles cannot be copyrighted. So James Kugel, and Jim, I, mean, I like him, and when I'm in Israel, we're literally across the street from each other. He's a, I call him, he's a bifurcator. I mean, he really do, is, he's a, there's a scholar who reads the Bible from a historical critical perspective, and there is the Jew, who, the observant Jew, whom I often see you know, with his black kippah walking to synagogue at various times of the day, and he doesn't try to fit those two together. I really do try to fit those two together. Uh, so for me, I think the human creation of the Bible as a reflection of ancient Israelite understanding of its God is the way in which I understand the Bible. And you know, I'm not going to enforce that upon anyone. And I also understand that part of that human creation was trying to understand that God, trying to understand uh, what that God wants from us, and trying to understand and firmly believing, and I'll make this clear in a, in a sentence in a second, that ultimately, for within Jewish religiosity, it is not the Bible that is important, but it is the Bible interpreted by my ancestors, which I see myself as being in continuation with, that really is important. So I'm going to, I once started an article in the following way, which was intended to be jarring. In Judaism, the Bible is not important, semicolon. It is the Bible as it was interpreted that, that is really important. So <clears throat> it is that semicolon which holds the tension between the different Mark Brettlers but I think brings them into a creative, tries to bring them into some sort of creative relationship, which is not only one of tension. Thank you, Professor. Thank you all very much.
come daven with us, have some lunch, come back at 12.30. Shabbat shalom. Thanks so much. That's wonderful. Let me take it from you. It's okay.